It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Hans Klavers. Hans is a, a geneticist and physician. He is currently professor at the University of Utrecht and group leader at the Hubricht Institute for Developmental Biology and Stem Cell Research, and also group leader of the Princess Maxima Center for Pediatric Oncology and Oncode Investigator. Hans has held positions as professor in immunology at the University of Utrecht and also professor in molecular genetics. He was also president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2019, Hans collaborated <coughs> with Jakob van der Berkel regarding the science underpinning the making of the DNA room in the host in Bos, The Hague, the Netherlands. His presentation today is titled The Genetic Code, Beauty and the Diversity, Diversity Emerging Out of Error. Welcome, Hans. Thanks very much, Liana, for, um, for this kind introduction. I'll I have to do a few things. I'll share my screen. I hope that everything works. Uh, and maybe you can tell me whether you see this. Yes, yeah? we can okay. see, th see that very clearly. Thank okay. you, Hans. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, so I'm a scientist. I've been involved in studying genes and cells for the past 35 years. And I've always had some interest in art. Uh, I collaborated indeed with Jacob a little bit. I, I, I we, we together thought about what kinds of genetic codes we could hide in the DNA room. I, I'll have one slide on this. Um, but I've also worked with Charlotte Jarvis. And what I'd like to do is uh, first show you a, a short movie where she introduces a project that we did together. Um, she'll give the, art, the artist's view on what we did, and I'll then give you the scientific underpinnings of the experiments that we did with her tissue, and I'll do this with reference to uh, Jacob's work. Et in Arcadia ego means even in paradise I am here, and the I is supposed to be death. So it is a reference to a Poussin painting, and it is saying that death is everywhere, that you cannot escape him. For this project, I collaborated with scientists in the Netherlands uh, to grow my own tumour from healthy cells that I donated to those scientists, and they mutated them into cancer cells. I collaborated with a scientist called Hans Klevers, and I gave Hans, through colonoscopy, a sample of my bowel, a healthy sample. And he grew that sample into something called an organoid, which is kind of a more organized patch of tissue. He then put that organoid through four separate mutations, one at a time. And at the end of those four mutations, we had 100% malignant cancer cells. In the exhibition, um, we have a waiting room, which is where I'm sitting. And it's kind of the waiting room from my nightmares. It's what I imagine um, as an awful space where you're waiting for your test results. So I have a lot of correspondence on the wall, which are emails and also pages from my sketchbook and conversations um, that tell the story of how the work was made. And on the other wall, uh, we have a video installation. And that video installation is an attempt on my part to document my emotional process of making the project. So it's much more abstract and it's much more about how I feel about the work as opposed to the literal story of how the work was made. In the back, there is a, a long corridor which you walk down and you go into a room which is filled with soil and it's very dark um, and there's some string music and the soil forms um, a mound in the center on which there is a mirrored box and inside the mirrored box there is a petri dish with my cancer in it. So I wanted to create a space that was somehow neutral, somehow about living and proliferation, but also about dying and things ending. I wanted a sense of vertigo or, or um, perspective, a sense of the infinite. And when you look inside the box, because all of the sides are mirrored, the, the Petri dish with the cancer is um, reflected infinitely across the different mirrors. I think cancer is very interesting um, and very difficult for us to deal with because it comes from our own bodies. So we feel very confused about cancer because it is simultaneously a part of us, 
and it is also something that we want to get rid of and something that we want to destroy. And I am interested in how that is very similar to mortality. You know, our life is really defined by the fact that it is finite, that we die. We know that life is meaningless if it goes on forever, yet we still hold on to it really, really, really strongly. Um, so I think cancer is almost the, the ultimate um, metaphor, if you like, the ultimate symbol for human mortality. Okay, with that, I'll, I'll now try to give you uh, in, in several small blocks the scientific background of the experiment that we did together and that, that she then turned into an, uh, an art object. Uh, Charlotte mentioned that life is not uh, indefinite, it's, it's finite. Uh, you probably all recognize this process, aging, and what this really is in the biological sense. Uh, we consist of cells, they make up tissues and organs, and our cells work very, very hard, and they don't live as long as our body lives. They live much shorter, and therefore we gradually lose young cells in our tissues, and this leads to graying of the hair, and to, we see changes in the skin, but this happens in, in every organ. Now, we're not against, uh, we are not without defense against this process. Uh, Jacob has uh, worked on self-healing concrete. Actually, nature was, did this before him. All of our tissues have dedicated stem cells, many, many different types. And what these stem cells can do is they sense whenever cells are lost in, say, the liver, that's the organ we now look at. And as soon as cells are lost, the stem cells divide, they produce a lot of daughter cells. And these daughter cells then replace the, the cells in the exact way uh, that they were originally uh, present in this tissue. And you see this happening here for, for the liver, as I said. You can probably realize that if this system goes awry, if the stem cells are no longer active enough, you age. If they're overactive, that stem cell will actually produce a tumor, a cancer, and I'll get back to that a little bit later. So my research about 25 years ago uh, started focusing on an organ that you probably recognize as the bowel, as the gut of a mammal, of a mouse, or as a human being. The insides of the gut have these surface protrusions that extend the, uh, the effective surface area so that we can digest nutrients and take the nutrients up very efficiently. And in between those protrusions that we call the villi, are these little pits that are called the crypts of Lieberkuhn. And for a long time, it had, be, uh, had been uh, uh, thought that the base of these crypts would contain the stem cells of this particular organ of the gut, the gut stem cells. And it was also known that these should be the champions of all stem cells, the most active stem cells in human bodies. Uh, what you see here uh, from left to right is again the gut. So it's a tube, food comes from the left and leaves uh, to the right. This is one of those villi. Um, these are the crypts. A village is surrounded by about 10 of these crypts. And from these crypts, there is a constant stream of cells that are born somewhere here from the stem cells. They divide a few times. Two days after they are born, they leave the crypts. They then mature into one of the many different cell types that you need to digest food and take up the nutrients. They live for another two days while they move up. And four days after they are born, they reach the tips of the villi. They're extruded and then are digested much like the food that's passing by. Um, so this tissue, the insides of the gut, cell renew, as we call this, every four to five days. So um, this means that every day your gut produces about 100 grams of these cells, and four days later, these cells, these 100 grams of cells, will be actually uh, will die and will be uh, then digested by the gut. We we have, and this was Nick Barker, looked to try to find these stem cells. Was their exact identity was unknown, and using lots of tricks in mice, in particular, originally, we uh, we found potential stem cells, we created the confetti mouse in which we can mark cells in multi, many, many different fluorescent colors. And uh, what you can see here is an animation of Jeroen Huyben, who thought that this is what we would see in these mice if we would mark the stem cells at the base of this pit at the crypt, it, they would produce daughter cells. Every stem cell would have a specific color. All the daughter cells of that stem cells would have the same color. And he predicted that the insides of the gut of these mice should look like this. And I, I stress these are fluorescent colors. You have to put a black light on, uh, uh, on these tissues. And indeed, that's what we see. 
Uh, this is a living mouse gut, and one of these confetti mice. The outside of the gut is here, so this again is the, the tube of the gut where the food would pass by. These are individual villi, these protrusions that I mentioned. These are the pits, and as you can see, every pit resolves into a single color, yellow, red or blue, or green. And on a blow-up, it even looks more beautiful. You can now see individual cells. So this particular crypt, for the lifetime of a mouse, produces blue fluorescent cells. This one, right next door, produces red fluorescent cells. And in zebra-like bands, they, their daughter cells move up towards the tips of the villi that you cannot see here. And four days after they're born here, they will die. This, this confirmed the idea that we had that these small cells at the base of the pit were indeed the stem cells of the gut. Um, we then tried to culture these stem cells, and this is about 10 years ago, done by Toshi Sato, a Japanese gastroenterologist in my lab. Uh, it was then believed that normal cells cannot be grown in the lab. You can only do this with cancer cells. That had been done for 60 years. But we managed to come up with, um, with a condition where we could take a single stem cell. You can see here, we add growth factors. You have to think of substances like EPO. EPO stimulates stem cells in the, in the bone marrow of uh, of bicyclists. Um, this stem cell here apparently feels happy enough to start dividing in a petri dish, in a plastic dish, and then produces these structures that we first didn't really recognize, but then uh, you can see here the movies of how they grow. We realized that these are attempts by this single stem cell to recreate a tiny little version of the gut of, in this case, a mouse. Later on, we could also do this for humans. And everything that you would find in a normal gut in a mouse is present in these uh, what we now call mini guts, or in a more general term, organoids. So an organ-like structure grown from stem cells in a plastic dish outside the human body. Um, originally, we and many other people believed that they grew so well, they grow much longer than the mouse would have ever lived that we got the stem cells from. We thought they must have still be turned into cancer cells that are known to grow forever. Um, together with Mamoru Matanabe in Tokyo, we, uh, we generated mini guts from a mouse that was marked in red. And these red Dutch mini guts were then sent to Tokyo where they were transplanted into the insides of, uh, of mice, multiple mice with inflammatory bowel disease. And you see here how these red Dutch mini guts float around, then find these lesions in the wall of the gut of these mice that have inflammatory bowel disease. They actually then attach, they open up, and like a living band-aid, they seal the lesions. And actually, the mice that receive these Dutch red mini guts uh, cure themselves much more rapidly than the control mice. So, so from this, we concluded, indeed, we are growing genuine um, organs from a single stem cell in the lab. Now, since then, we've come up with, with conditions in this Petri dish. We have to add a lot of chemical substances, but that allows us not only to grow the stem cell of the gut, but we can now do, for, we can now do this for almost every organ. And <clears throat> this now allows um, a lot of opportunities for um, doing all sorts of studies in, uh, in man. And a, ver a version here is uh, a mini liver. You probably have never looked under the microscope uh, at a liver, but this really is what it looks like. So we can grow these livers, beautiful tissue, we think. Another organ here is the, uh, the airway of the lung and these green protrusions. This is a single cell with a lot of these little hairs. So these hairs can move in a real, real airway of the lung and they also move in our mini organs. And this allows the transport of mucus out of the lungs to your oral cavity and keeps your airways uh, clean. Also, these are the cells that get infected by the coronavirus and I'll show you that a little bit later. Other labs had meanwhile uh, succeeded in, in growing mini brains, human mini brains. And again, this is a, a movie. So here you start from a different type of stem cells. You cannot actually see the person who did this, Madeleine Lancaster. So these, uh, these stem cells uh, come from a very early embryo. They can make any organ. And um, there we go. Um, this is a long process. Uh, where you have of multiple months where you have to do take multiple steps. It's, it's like a recipe in the kitchen that takes forever. Uh, you can see here the different things that are being done in the lab. You see a small clump of cells that is slowly instructed to become brain tissue. Uh, it, it involves um, yet another manipulation that you can see here. More growth factors in the gel are added. 
um, they slowly mature from stem cells into brain tissue. They should be, uh, as Madeline says, shaken, not stirred. And eventually you end up with uh, small versions that really recap re recapitulate parts of a, of a human brain. Uh, a, a neurobiologist would immediately recognize this zone, this is a zone of production of cells in the brain. And I think the movie ends with a nice overview of, you see that here, of how close these mini brains, this is a very complex, comp complex one, how close they resemble a real human brain. Um, when you go on uh, on Twitter and you look for a hashtag mini brain, as they're called uh, colloquially in the lab, you might find uh, this particular image first. And the next thing you might, might find is actually this, uh, this, you couldn't resist to show to you, the mini brain on Twitter. Um, these organoids can be used for many, many things. Just one illustration. Here we have a human gut organoid. It could also be a human lung organoid. And we tested, here we had the question, can we infect human gut organoids with the SARS coronavirus, uh, the COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, virus? And indeed, we managed to, uh, to infect gut organoids. White is essentially a cell that has that's producing a lot of virus. This is after one day after we expose the organoid to the virus. If you then wait for another two days, you can see that the virus has spread widely through this organoid. And this we published uh, half a year ago. And it's now generally uh, accepted that this virus not only affects the lungs of patients, but also infects many other organs, including the gut, as we show here. So that's one piece of the story uh, of the experiment we did with Charlotte. Um, another one refers to DNA. Jacob has, has, has a lot of references to DNA in his work. So DNA is the carrier of the universal, universal genetic code. Uh, originally uh, des de described in the 40s as the potential carrier of, of hereditary traits. In uh, 54, Watson, Crick, Rosalind Franklin, and Morris Wilkins essentially resolved the structure of the DNA helix. So it's a double helix. You probably have seen this helix many, many times. Unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin didn't live long enough to, uh, to receive the Nobel Prize for a discovery to which she made a major contribution. This is now how we know that this helix looks like, and actually it was in the previous photo. These are the letters of the code. And essentially, it's a, it's a linear code. Uh, this is an A, this is an A, this is an A, an A. This is a C, a T, a C, an A, a G. So you can read it like this. Now, in the, it became possible to easily read the code of DNA in the 70s. And uh, before that, people had already resolved the code. So Watson and Crick only showed what the structure of DNA is. They con then contributed it when they realized there was a code of four letters how this code actually works and is translated into genes and to proteins. We then needed assays to read DNA. And uh, one of the early assays essentially uh, produces something that looks like this, four lanes for each of the letters. And you basically read it much like this. You read A, T, A, 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 C, a T, C, A. And that's how you actually can, can fill a word file. You then have to ask, okay, what is written in this code? Now, what this in practice looked like is, is this is one of, I've done this many, many times in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, four lanes is, is one DNA molecule. Here's another helix, here's another helix. So we can all read these from bottom to top. And I show this because uh, when, Johan, when Jacob van der Beugel first approached me to be involved, advise him a little bit on his project in the uh, Royal Palace in The Hague, in the DNA salon, he showed me his design, and eventually this is the outcome of that design. And I realized that I'd seen this pattern a number of years before, but it took me a while to realize it's actually a 90% turn of the gel that I just showed you. So in essence, this is DNA, and you can read it, I guess, from left to right or from right to left. And, and four of these ribbons would give you one DNA code. Now, the DNA code is universal. Everything that lives on our planet, from a bacterium to a yeast, a virus doesn't really live, but has the same code. Mammals, as you see here, reptilians, fish, insects, ferns, mushrooms, trees, flowers, they all use the exact same code. And it is assumed that a long time ago, there was a single cell called LUCA 
there was the first cell that used this code. It then started dividing, and in that division, it 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 made small errors in its DNA code, generating diversity, and then the selection, as first described by Darwin, would then eventually lead that code to to encode for something like a tiger or a flower or a bird. But but I'd stress again, the DNA code is universal, and we can take DNA from a tiger and basically put it in a plant, and it'll work as if it's a tiger gene in a plant and vice versa. And actually, that's being done quite regularly in, in labs. Um, you might have heard of CRISPR. Uh, this year's uh, Nobel Prize. This book if you play. Sorry here. Yeah, so what, what CRISPR is, I don't really, I don't realize why this doesn't work. So what it does is it, um, it can, it allows us to rewrite the DNA code. So here you see an area that we would like to rewrite. Maybe it's a genetic error in a human genetic disease. Maybe it's an interesting gene that we want to study. Uh, with CRISPR, we can actually specifically locate that in the large genome, exactly the spot where we want to make the change. So that's done by this this blue part of the CRISPR-Cas9. This is a protein that actually will then cause a cut in the DNA, a break, and that is not allowed. So a cell cannot live with a break. It then has to somehow repair the break in the chromosome, or otherwise it'll die. We help the cell by giving a little bit of a little piece of DNA, as you can see here. It, as you can see, it fits very nicely. It matches exactly to these sequences, but instead of the red sequence, it here is green. And if we now let the cell repair the break. This is what it does. It repairs the break, but at the same time, it has replaced the red sequence by the green sequence. Uh, we already knew how to do these things for quite some time, uh, but these were very, very tedious procedures, often taking years. And with CRISPR-Cas9, we can almost do this overnight. And, and essentially, you can sit behind a computer, design any change in the DNA of a cell, uh, and then introduce that, that change in the code in that cell. And we can even make uh, entire mice from cells where we have introduced these changes. And actually the confetti mouse that I showed earlier was made exactly in this way. So I told you that the different species of everything that lives on Earth uh, has been generated by small errors in DNA copying um, and then selection for, for things that nature likes, uh, eventually resulting in tigers and in flowers and in ferns. Um, cancer does the same thing, but in a rapid way, and it's not between species, but it's actually in a single individual. And what happens in cancer is that normal cells, I just showed you the stem cells of the gut, they would be somewhere here. In their lifetime, the stem cells will acquire some mutations, and if the stem cell is unlucky, it, these mutations, these changes in the DNA hit cancer genes, and we have about 500 genes that can be involved in, in cancer. And in a stepwise fashion, uh, you need three or four of these mutations to turn a perfectly normal stem cell into something that is not only growing, like a benign lesion, an adenoma, but is also growing in an invasive fashion and metastasizes colonizing other organs in the body. So essentially, this is the same process that you would see happening in nature during evolution, but this all happens in a matter of maybe uh, 10 years, and the outcome is not something that you would like. Now, what we uh, what we did with Charlotte, uh, she had a colonoscopy, and a tiny piece of tissue from the insides of her colon was removed, was, was sent to us. Um, and we'd hope to, re to uh, recapitulate the process of normal carcinogenesis. And we did this um, by introducing, with CRISPR, four different cancer mutations. So this is a, a, the normal colon organoid of Charlotte. We introduced a first mutation with CRISPR-Cas9 in the APC gene. We, get, we now get cells that, slightly, that grow slightly faster. Uh, we introduce a second mutation uh, in the P53 gene. It's often mutated in cancer. Uh, the cells are now even a little bit more malignant than they were with one mutation, but still they're not a full-blown cancer. They're called an intermediate polyp or, or an intermediate adenoma. A third mutation is introduced in the KRAS gene, still not a full-blown cancer, but it's already getting close. And then finally, we hit a four gene, and this, this whole process takes a few months, uh, targeting a gene called SMAS4, and now we have a full-blown colon cancer cell that is almost identical to Charlotte's own stem cells from the colon, 
only in four positions out of the three billion of her genome in that particular cell have we made these tiny changes that turn this normal cell into a stem cell. And if we transplant these, uh, these uh, organoids, these colon organoids with the four mutations, they will actually cause something that, that very closely resembles the human colon carcinoma. This is often done in, uh, in mice in cancer research. And with that, uh, I've reached the end of my uh, seminar, and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Hans, for your brilliant presentation. Um, we now have some questions from the audience. First of all, uh, do artists just respond to the work of scientists or can they also contribute knowledge to the research process? <laughs> yeah, that's a, a question that's often asked. I must say that most of the things we do are extremely detailed. Uh, you need to know a lot to take that next little step. Uh, but if I speak, speak from my own experience, have you, as you noticed, we have actually generated a lot of animations where we try to take our scientific discoveries and display them in such a way that they are understandable to other scientists. But it, it turns out that if they're done very well, they are usually understandable for, for, the, for lay audiences. And in the process of creating these animations with Jeroen Huybe, I often get questions from him that he says, well, you know, what you're now saying is impossible. You know, why why are you saying this cell sits here and the next moment it sits there and it cannot move there? Or have, have you thought of the idea of that? So so that actually, so as soon as he delves into, into our data, he comes up with questions at least that we can then address. And often this has helped our research. I'm not really sure that you would consider that art, the generation of animation movies. But um, well, yeah. you could you could consider the the fact that they're they're thinking about this idea through uh, an artistic perspective, so uh, how they're going to how they think about things visually, so you're thinking about it from a scientific uh, perspective, and they're thinking of it from a visual artistic perspective, oh. so I suppose that's um, how those two can come together. And uh, what was your takeaway from the exchange with Jakob van der Berkel and for Charlotte? With yeah, Charlotte. So, yeah with, uh, with Jakob, we sat down because Jakob had this idea of uh, creating the DNA room, the DNA salon for the king and the queen. Wanted to have somehow a representation of the king and the queen, but also for everything before and everything after, stressing the diversity of, of humankind. And uh, so together, so I, I created a list of genes that I thought that would be of interest. So they're all hidden. So if you're a molecular biologist, you can actually stand in front of, of this, this, these walls. And if you would then actually read the DNA and put them in a the computer, you can see which genes they are. And there is genetic sequence from the queen and from the king in the middle, if I'm correct. Uh, there's also a gene, a set of genes that are the most diverse between humans around the planet and we've created sort of a generic version that probably in that form doesn't exist but this is, is the uh, so the average of all versions of that particular gene we have a gene that um, that is probably uh, allowing us to talk to speak uh, allows speech uh, we have a gene that allows us the opposing thumb which is something unique to humans we have a gene that goes back to the ability to drink milk uh, that we acquired when humans moved up north um, I believe we have a gene, I'm not sure if that made it, that has allowed people to live uh, on the top of the mountains, above 4,000 meters, uh, that somehow makes the human body more able to take up oxygen, if there's not much. So that's all, and then, and then it also goes back in history, and then we predict what would happen to human genetics in the future. Okay. Of, uh, and this is all hidden in, uh, in the code that's on that wall. Yes, yes, fascinating. And so uh, going back to the first question um, about your, or when you were talking about the animations, uh, so this illustrates the illustrative power of art, uh, but uh, the real problem for art is to think of problems, not technical, but to rethink whether the technical adaptations would have other than technical representations on human life in general. So sort of towards the uh, Svanenberg viewpoint. Yeah, Would I'm not you... really sure if I understand. <laughs> you have to translate this. 
So uh, the, the question is, uh, so uh, the real problem for art is uh, that the artists are thinking about problems and not necessarily a technical problem. So they're thinking about the world they're in. Um, but to rethink whether the technical adaptations would have other uh, other than technical uh, repercussions on human life in general. Yeah, so what I can say there is that so this particular discipline of biomedicine, which is essentially uh, recombining DNA, um, working with stem cells, creating embryos, modifying genes in living organisms, is probably the area in science that creates most ethical questions. So I must say we, we interact a lot with ethicists. So every time we come up with a new technology um, that we get very enthusiastic about because we can now ask questions that we could never be before because we have the technology, uh, immediately this raises um, questions. For instance, one that's very uh, topic now, we can actually create, not my lab is not doing this, but other labs, we can actually put stem cells together and create an, a human embryo without uh, the involvement of a sperm and an egg. And this, is, this has never happened on this planet, ever. So how should we view what we make? Is this a living being? Uh, should we do this? Why should we do this? Are we allowed to do this? So in there, I think, well, we get a lot of input from philosophers and from ethicists, but artists with these questions could probably also, they could probably better than us predict what, what would, would then evolve out of this and what questions and issues would arise from that. But but I think, again, that, that this particular uh, plain discipline of science every year surprises the scientists themselves, but the rest of the world, of what is possible in the lab in the manipulation of life. Yeah, so, so to, yeah, I guess there's a, there's a huge role for artists in this. Yes, issue. yes. And the the, uh, the ethical considerations involved in some of this, and having the viewpoints from artists as well, is is uh, oh. a valuable perspective. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Hans, uh, for your wonderful contribution, and uh, we'll hope you can join us for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Very nice. Bye bye.